Hi everyone and welcome to the Faces and FinOps, powered by our great friends at ProsperOps. I'm your host, John Meyer. Faces and FinOps podcast is all about highlighting the thought leaders in the cloud financial management space and how they're making an impact, not only within their organization, but within the broader FinOps community. Today's guest is Matt Mazur, a FinOps manager at a Fortune 100 company. You know, Matt is an accomplished IT professional with over 20 plus years of experience and holding an undergrad degree at the University of Miami, also an MBA from Franklin University. Please join me in welcoming Matt to the show. Matt, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the pod. Matt, we've got a bunch of questions here for you and really kind of center around your FinOps journey and your expertise, but how about you share a little bit of information about yourself? Uh, certainly. So Matt Mazur, I live in uh, Dublin, Ohio. As you've stated, I have a little over 20 plus years of IT experience. And uh, my most current role is a FinOps manager uh, for the past three and a half years. Let's talk about your current role as a FinOps manager. Really, what does that entail? (laughs) That is actually a great question. And I feel my current role actually has many hats. So uh, those that follow the FinOps Foundation, I absolutely support all of the domains and capabilities, but my current role revolves around much more than just uh, the basics of FinOps. So uh, first, we are multi-cloud. So we are managing cloud spend for AWS, GCP, and a small little bit of Azure. Then we also get involved in contract negotiations. So enterprise agreements, new tool, uh, bringing new tools into the environment. Then we also are responsible for the visualization layer. And so we are responsible for making sure that our tool is up and running, making sure that the data is correct and making sure that our end user, uh, whomever it may be, can get the segmented data that they are looking for. Then we also uh, need to uh, work on our roadmap. And that is what does FinOps look like now? What does it look like a year from now? What does it look three years from now? Uh, Then there's a whole host of other activities um, that I actually jotted down just in case. So I'm going to glance down. So data integrity, making sure all of our data is correct. So we ingest data from our uh, cloud providers at different points. Once we ingest the data, sometimes there's data integrity challenges. So then we are firefighters to make sure our end users always have accurate data. Uh, We partner with various teams, so we're responsible for uh, assisting with forecast, assisting with budgets, and uh, also uh, future planning. Well, Matt, let me jump in there and ask a couple of questions, not only about your role, but your organization and, you know, the FinOps function within it. How would you actually rank your maturity level within your organization? Is it you in a crawl? Are you in a walk? Are you in a run stage throughout all of this? Yeah, I would say for the most part, we're in a walk or a run on almost all aspects of uh, FinOps. As an organization, we've had the FinOps practice for a little over uh, six plus years. So many items such as the visualization layer, uh, our committed spends, um, our tagging, most items we are uh, walk or run. Uh, One thing I would say is, and this is probably true for all organizations, it is a continuous process that is never ending. So anytime I feel like we're kind of close to the sun or as close as we can get on certain things, there's always more that can be done to optimize our spend. Matt, you said you're multi-cloud. Are you, by having a chance, like in a crawl in one cloud, a run in another, and a walk? Or does all of that actually kind of uh, sync up together where you're kind of in a walk within all three clouds? Yeah, for our our two primary, uh, we're really uh, that walk to run. And then uh, the other one that's a much smaller portion of our spend, we're really uh, 
crawl in that environment. And the reason is there just isn't as much opportunity or dollars being spent. And uh, we, uh, being candid, we don't have the bandwidth uh, to go after all things. We try to prioritize based off of opportunity and where we would see our return on investment. Now, how would you describe the process of implementing the FinOps culture for multi-cloud? Was it difficult? Uh, was it easy to achieve following the rules and guidelines for you know FinOps? Or how would you kind of rank that? I would say it is a challenge because ultimately most of our end users, so our VPs or our cost center owners, they want to see a single pane of glass and they really just want to see their individual costs. They don't necessarily care if they're in two clouds. They don't care if they have a committed spend agreement. All they want to do is understand what is their cost and what are their levers to optimize uh, that cost. And so it, it has been a little bit of a challenge to get them to that single pane of glass. We're doing a good job, again, with all things in FinOps, there's still room for improvement. There's always room for improvement as you progress through the crawl, walk, run. Uh, you implemented different variations of the phases where you know what you can tweak, you tweak it, and you improve little by little. Would you agree? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, when we come up with our yearly goals or modify our quarterly goals, oftentimes we remark amongst ourselves, hey, we're not really bringing anything groundbreaking or earth shattering or really like net new it's we kind of do this we need to continue to Im improve upon this or we've been going at it and we're at 80 uh, percent against our committed spend can we go to 85 can we meet with additional teams uh if it's something on storage can we uh drop it to a lower class storage because we don't necessarily need it it's it's always tweaking but it's not necessarily anything earth shattering or brand new. Matt, would you say it's continuous improvements and it could be small chunks at a time, but you're always moving forward and trying to improve little by little? It is absolutely continuous improvement. And uh, again, I've been in my role for three years. So the optimization opportunities when I first started were much greater than what they are today. And the reason is, We've refined, we've evolved as a company. We've gotten uh, rid of a lot of like zombie resources. We've implemented start stop tags. We've done committed spend. All these things have decreased our cost or optimized our spend. So as you go forward in your FinOps journey, it becomes more and more of a challenge to save the big dollars. Matt, are you using any type of like automation to complete some of these tasks, not only on the optimization efforts, but say in the reporting structure? Yes. Um, so we absolutely uh, leverage uh, certain automation. So uh, the simple answer is yes. We also do some anomaly detection so people know. Uh, we've also automated reports so an end user can see when they have spikes and they can address those in a timely manner versus waiting, uh, let's say, till the end of the quarter. So they now get the highlights or the reports on a weekly basis. They can take action. Where we'd like to head as an organization is to take it even a step further where you get the anomaly detection and then it's almost like an opt out where the change will be automatically implemented if you do not opt out. We are not there yet. That is on our roadmap for uh, the future. Right now, it's you get an alert, but then you still have to take action. I like that. You have to opt out before the action is actually taken for optimization. So you have to validate that the action is worthwhile and you have to invest, you know, kind of look into it and dig into it a little bit more. Yes, absolutely. Now, the reporting that you were talking about, is that a daily reporting? Is it a weekly reporting, real time? I mean, I, I know you kind of went and touched on the anomaly detection, but is a report generated automatically or is this something that you're looked at like weekly? Yeah, so it actually depends on 
uh, the subscriber of uh, the data. Uh, so some of our cost centers and VPs would like to see their data on a daily basis. I, for one, need to see the data on a daily basis. So I get a daily report. I can see if there's any spikes in our overall cloud spend. I have some uh, end users that want to see it on a weekly basis, some that want to see it on a bi-weekly basis, and some that want to see it on a monthly basis. What we do is we set up uh, standardized reporting, but then uh, the frequency that they receive the data is really up to them. Do you find it challenging that the reporting might be uh, out there like biweekly, monthly or something like that in order to actually perform this action? Is reporting supposed to be daily or is it really kind of based off your environment? In the beginning, it was done daily, but as you progress and you matured a lot longer, uh, it's done monthly. Um, no, it, it really it varies by uh, by business segment or cost center, really what their spend is. Uh, for the most part, most of our spend is somewhat stable at this point. We do support projects, we do support mergers and acquisitions, and there is testing and that kind of stuff. But our cloud spend is much more stable than it was in the beginning. And so most of our uh, end users do not require the daily uh, reports. I still want to see the daily reports because I want to know if there's any major spikes. I also want to know if I have a data integrity issue before I have 15, 20, 50 people saying, hey, what's wrong with the reports? My spend is out of whack. Um, that probably wasn't the best grammar, but uh, spend is not what it was supposed to be. And um, so I, I want to be preemptive so I can send out a mass email just saying, hey, we know we have a data integrity issue. We understand this. We expect to have it resolved within the next 24 hours. Look for the next update. And that way I'm not feeding questions. I'm also building trust amongst uh, my end users so they know what to expect. They know that we're on top of our data sets. I think you just nailed it right there. The data integrity and building the trust amongst the users is that if the data is incorrect, then they're not going to trust the actions that need to be performed in order to optimize or reduce spend or even scale or to grow an environment. That is 100% true. And uh, I will say that early uh, a as a team, we at different points had data integrity issues. And sometimes there were small instances where we actually found out about it when a team was drilling into the data. There's no worse feeling than having a team come to you. It's our data, our reports, and they're saying something doesn't look right. I always want to be ahead of it, understand if I have a problem, and again, building that trust so that people feel empowered that the data they have is correct, it is accurate, and they can take action on it. Matt, let me ask from your expertise, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see maybe an immature FinOps team implement or try to achieve? Oh, I, I would say not spending the time up front to uh, establish tagging governance. So everything as it comes back to anytime you want to segment the cost, it always comes back to tagging. We are, as I said, many years into our journey and we're still doing tagging cleanup. And when you're trying to find an owner, if a tag's incorrect, it, it's a pain. It requires manual intervention. There's lost stuff where you don't know truly where to assign the cost. Then my guess is your organization will need a, a, a dumping ground, a centralized for anything that you don't have an owner goes to that cost center. But my advice to anybody just starting out, invest in tagging governance and really make sure you're tagging everything up front and make sure you have good policies around it. FinOps culture and tagging is proper and required for a successful environment. Actually, that was just a little bit kind of digging into it and talking more about, We, I just asked you about some of the mistakes you think in immature but I feel that tagging even a mature FinOps culture still makes those mistakes. 
is that one thing that you see out there or is there a recommendation where you can see maybe like a mature one that can make or kind of learn from? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned it. So yes, we still have tagging challenges in our company. Uh, so uh, we have automation, we have a governance team that is checking all of the tags. That being said, there are limitations to our checks and balance balances. And so bad tags uh, still come through the system. Then my team has to clean them up whenever we're doing the chargeback. So uh, yes, tagging is imperative. It seems like a never ending battle. Um, so I, I, I would just say, good luck if you could force tagging to be almost like a drop down where only valid cost centers, valid uh, tags are utilized. I think that would be great. We as a company aren't there where it can be just a total drop down um, so that it would avoid all incorrect tags, but it, it's never ending. I think even cloud providers could offer that as a drop down rather than an open field where you can enter any text up to like 50 to 100 characters. It accepts all of them. But the problem with that is that it also accepts uppercase, lowercase, and those are unique in some cases. So Matt, before we wrap things up with our first part, you were the third FinOps hire within your organization. What were some of the key things that you did once you entered the company? What were some of the things that you wanted to implement or tried to do? I wanted to, I come from a PM background. So I've always been, uh, I don't want to say taught the uh, three key P eh, three key project management principles. So I was concerned that we were consistently as an organization missing our budget and missing it by uh, over double. And so what I wanted to do was understand the budget. I wanted to have metrics in place to understand exactly where we were at against budget and then try and uh, provide solutions to get us closer to budget. So that was really my focus to understand costs and um, really get us back on budget. What were you doing prior to joining your current company? Yes. Uh, so my prior experience actually was a program manager for actually another Fortune 100 company. And then I was traveling a lot and family and personal situation elected to switch uh, companies, came to my current employer, joined as a project manager, uh, quickly excelled as a project manager, became a program manager. Then from there became a people manager of project managers. Then we did a major initiative at my company, became a project or a program manager again. And then from there, I supported a lot of cloud initiatives where we were moving from on-prem to cloud uh, solutions. And it was a natural transition to get back into people management. And I really viewed FinOps as the future because I always like to tell people it's a unique opportunity to influence the company's bottom line. And I really get excited about the financials and the opportunity to influence the financials and the FinOps manager role really seemed a great fit for somebody with my background in project and program management, an interest in the finances and an interest in people management. I think your project manager background helps you because you did the cloud migrations. You went through some of it. You've seen what they look like and you were part of, you know, the budget and you've seen the cost for it. And it was a natural progression into a FinOps manager. It just feels like a normal progression to me. Yes, I, I would agree. In fact, uh, several of our team members uh, actually got their start in uh, project management, project management and program management definitely gives you a diverse background and really gets you an opportunity to see how a large company works, see what's important to the company, and then see how you could fit in and help and influence positive change. Well, Matt, speaking of your team, what are some of the things that your team's responsible for? Yeah, so my team has... Uh, again, on part one, we discussed uh, some of the many hats that 
I wear. So my team is responsible. We have a billing arm. So they are responsible for the chargeback, the POs, uh, supporting our sourcing team. Then I have a team of advisors. They are your front line. They are providing support to uh, various cloud champions, VPs. They're assisting with our visualization tool. They're helping with optimization opportunities. They're helping to set up reports. They also have an education component. They're teaching teams uh, FinOps basics. They are, um, they're really the front line. And then I have an engineer team and the engineers are maintaining our visualization tool and they're also working on enterprise uh, solutions. So when I say enterprise solutions, it's multifold. So you have uh, the roadmaps, you have your enterprise agreements with your uh, major cloud providers, then you have your secondary agreements with uh, your third party tools. Then you're also looking at enterprise committed spend discounts that they're assisting with. Um, so they are also wearing many hats. So in the current role, again, it's many hats, many responsibilities, all with the ultimate goal of optimizing our cloud spend. Matt, is yours a centralized FinOps team or decentralized, or are you using a variation of both? Yeah, so so we are uh, central. We're considered an enterprise uh, team. That being said, at our company, uh, we do not have kind of, at a lot of other companies, there's a center of excellence or a COE for all of cloud. Uh, there are still uh, silos uh, within our company. Um, so it's, I guess you'd say a little bit of everything. A little bit of a mix, but it still works for your company. There's actually, now while centralize is recommended, you could do C decentralized, you can do a hub and spoke, but whatever works best for your company, as long as it's efficient and achieving the results that you're looking for, right? Yes, I, I would agree 100%. The other thing I would add and you see it in most of like FinOps and high performing teams, really having strong uh, executive support. Uh, I think that's a requirement when you have key executive buy-in, they help influence change, they help uh, get the attention and they help push for optimization. What is What is your typical day, your week or even month look like within your organization? Yeah, so, uh, in the beginning of the month, uh, it's uh, making sure that all of our chargebacks from the previous month are complete, making sure all the costs are being distributed evenly. So the first week or to two weeks, it's all about chargebacks and data integrity. And then it quickly shifts. Once the chargebacks are done, then you're really kind of going on what I'll call the roadshow or the disseminating of all the information. So we have uh, governance reviews that's at the executive level. You're showing uh, the cost breakdown of all their expenses, including all of the previous month's uh, charges. You're partnering with finance, you're partnering with sourcing, you're showing uh, everything that's coming up as well. So first part, get your data right. Second part of the month is really presenting the data and in between, you're always maintaining that data integrity. So making sure your reporting's always up, always working, all the data is correct. You're constantly on a monthly basis looking at additional committed spend purchases. You're also uh, doing vendor meets because you want to make sure that there isn't a new tool that could sig significantly aid in your FinOps journey. Um, uh, it's it's nonstop, but it's it's a fun space to be in because every day is slightly different and every day gives you the opportunity to learn something new. What are some of the biggest challenges you or your team are facing today? Uh, right now, we have a few. So our data normalization for our, uh, for our visualization tool is one. So we have manual workarounds to get all data from all different providers to look exactly the same so they can see a single single one page view of where they're at uh, with cloud spend. Um, 
a, another area is just how can we continue to push um, on optimizing our costs and is it additional committed spend discounts but we're we're pretty good there so we're running out of options there so then it's it's looking at additional tools uh, is there anything else it's meeting with our primary vendors and seeing if they have any suggestions it's scouring um like google recommend their uh aws kudos it's it's non-stop we are a low margin uh business and we are consistently challenged with optimizing uh cost so we're really trying while well, still meeting the business needs because our our clients have really uh stringent requirements so it's it's getting creative and finding ways to still optimize Thanks, man. Let's talk about what's next. Do you see that, that possibly AI or automation will be impacting your role or FinOps in general? Uh, yes, I'm a firm believer in, in that. Uh, so funny story, I actually was just talking to somebody at lunch about this. My early, early part of my career, I was a provisioner for a telecom company. And so that's how I got my start in IT. And so what used to take me a day, uh, my whole workload in a day, now is completely automated. It can be done in less than a minute. And that's only 20 some years. Uh, so I absolutely think we are headed in that direction. That's probably not good for me to say, but. I imagine a lot of what we do today and a lot of what we what takes a lot of time for us will not be the same case in 20 years. I, I don't see I I don't see the role as it currently is structured. I don't I don't see it in the future in 20 years, 10 years. Yes, I think automation and even AI is going to enhance the FinOps role and make it more fine tuned that we're going to be able to do a lot more. Man, let's talk about some advice that you might give somebody or a company that's just trying to get started within their FinOps journey. Yeah, so my advice, I guess, would be executive sponsorship. So really make sure uh, oftentimes FinOps doesn't have true authority to force change. So you need that executive sponsorship. So executive sponsorship uh, would be one of the first things. Uh, then tagging governance, which we've uh, discussed. And then the other thing would be to just get started. Uh, there, you're never gonna find the perfect solution. There's gonna be different times you're gonna over purchase. There's gonna be other times you under purchase. My experience has been if you work with uh, your vendors, uh, they will oftentimes work with you even if you've made a commitment because oftentimes you're still going to make an additional larger commitment and they'll work with you. So don't be so afraid to get started that you can't make a decision. Start, just get started, uh, set it up. Don't worry about doing the whole big bang. Maybe do a small bit in September, then another bit in October, but get started. So Matt, I feel like I got to throw data integrity into some of the advice that you would give for teams that are just starting out in their FinOps journey. You've mentioned it a couple of times throughout this episode. And I think that's really key as, as much as you emphasize on having the correct data is having the trust in your engineers. What do you think? Absolutely. So data integrity is paramount. If people do not trust the data that you are providing, you are a check the box, oh, we have to talk to FinOps. You never want that. You want to have a partnership and you want the data to result in success stories. That way, when John does something great, he can say, look, we started at $1,000 a month. I followed FinOps best practices, turned off, uh, did some auto stop on some machines. I resized this. We went from a thousand to 800. Now, not only do you have a success story, you have a success story with data points and everybody loves a success story. So now 
uh, engineer two, Bob wants to do the same thing. And he's coming to John and saying, how did you do that? I want all the same kudos that you did, that you received. So data integrity is paramount. Uh, it's like internal evangelizing the process and the journey in order to implement it. Then you have the trust from the engineering teams. I like it. Matt, let me ask you that question a little bit in reverse of really you have a FinOps, a mature culture, an established team already in place. Is there any advice that you would give that team? Uh, celebrate successes and uh, continue to push the envelope there's always more opportunities and do not be afraid to fail. If we fail, it, let's, ha let's have our data behind us. Let's uh, demonstrate why we're making certain decisions, but let's not, let's not be fearful. Let's continue to try and uh, push and uh, just be ready to explain if it goes wrong. But, uh, so far, knock on wood, uh, our calculated, I don't even want to call them gambles, but our calculated decisions have uh, paid off, and I'd like to continue that mentality. Um, and then the other thing I would push, uh, even for us as a mature organization, continue to work to nurture that executive sponsorship and really get them on board when they are on board and they are excited uh, it just seems like the whole process runs uh, smoother and it's good to do stuff ahead of the fiscal year. So don't wait till the last six months of the fiscal year. It's a lot easier to make change and influence change and see real results when you have a longer runway. Well, Matt, this has been a very exciting and informative discussion, not only between your journey, but your company's journey and the teams of implementing the FinOps culture. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and let's have a little fun with a couple of uh, interesting questions. What do you think? Sounds great. Let's do it. All right. So, Matt, let me pick a question. Uh, I got one for you. So, Matt, you have you ever had the OG of iPods? Did you did you have the original one, like the Nano or the original? I did have the Nano, yes. Okay, all right. So imagine that you have the Nano and you're on an island. What music do you have on this? Oh, uh, can it be current music or do I have to think back <laughs> that, of what was that, originally that, on the Nano? Right, <laughs> that's right actually now, a great question. I don't even remember any of the music that was on the Nano at that time. You can pick any current music, but what is right. on it? So right now, believe it or not, I am a huge country fan. So it would be uh, Morgan Wallen. I know he's super popular. I know he's selling out stadiums everywhere, but that is who I would be listening to. And if you went back 20 plus years, I, I think, again, probably you wouldn't guess it, but probably like Jay-Z or Ice-T or some. Uh, or Wu-Tang Clan. Um, there you go. Hey, you somewhere. know what? I actually enjoyed the country and your list on the OG back 20 plus years ago. So I'm actually right there with you. Matt, I'm going to wrap things up and ask you, who are some of the most influential practitioners in the FinOps community now? Yeah, so uh, being uh, local to Columbus, Ohio, my first uh, recommendation for anybody that's interested in FinOps is always uh, Joe Daly. Uh, so he's dynamite. He is uh, very responsive, very engaged, and very active in Columbus. And then uh, other people just that I follow more from just on my LinkedIn feed uh, would be uh, JR, uh, who's in charge of uh, FinOps Foundation, then uh, Ben Demora, and then uh, just somebody that I uh, met at FinOps X. Uh, actually, I met a ton of amazing uh, practitioners and people, but uh, one of the key people that has been, in my opinion, one of the most knowledgeable is uh, Dan Ortman, who's out of uh, Software One. So he has a lot of insightful posts and just really, really knowledgeable. So Matt, I'm going to wrap things up with our latest episode of Faces in FinOps. Everyone, Matt Mazer, FinOps Manager at a Fortune 100 company. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again for having me. It was a blast.
All right, everybody, this has been another awesome episode and discussion around Faces and FinOps powered by our good friends at ProsperOps. Be sure to hit that like, subscribe, and notify, and to check out the latest ProsperOps blog. Because guess what? We're out of here.